History TV sits in on a lecture with one of the nation's college professors. Up next, Professor Kenneth Osgood looks at the CIA's efforts to overthrow leaders in other countries during the Cold War. All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you. Uh, as you can see from the screen here, the title of my lecture today is called The CIA and Regime Change in the Cold War. And I'm basically looking at, and I'll be talking about, efforts by the U.S. Intelligence Service, the Central Intelligence Agency, to overthrow foreign governments uh, during the Cold War period. And I'll be asking questions about what this means. Um, but I'd like to do things in kind of a, or sort of start things in kind of an unusual way. Historians, as you can imagine, we like to tell things in chronological order. We like to start at the beginning and end at the end. It makes writing a history paper very easy because you know where you start and you know where you end. But I'd like to do things a little bit differently today, and I'd like to jump across time and space. So I'm actually going to begin in 2001. Now, you guys are all a little bit younger than I am, but I think you're probably still old enough to have had a powerful memory of the events of September 11th, 2001. How many of you guys remember that, that event? How many of you guys or, uh, and women uh, remember where you were, what you were doing, right? I remember the start of that day vividly, right? Now, we Americans are not the only people to have a sort of September 11th in their nat national story. In Santiago, Chile, there was a September 11th event that had a dramatic impact on Chilean history and Chilean memory. On that day in 1973, military officers from the Chilean army and their units staged a full-scale assault on their own country. They took over radio stations, police stations, and other centers of power. In Santiago, they stormed the presidential palace, basically the Chilean White House, charged through, guns blazing, and when they were done, the president of Chile was dead. These events on September 11th for Chile begat a reign of terror led by an army general named Augusto Pinochet. Pinochet's regime remained in power for 17 years and was responsible for torture, murder, and repression. And what most Chileans did not know in 1973, and what many Americans still do not know, was that the coup of September 11th, 1973, was the work of intelligence operatives, American intelligence operatives, and they took their orders directly from the White House. Let's fast forward to 1998 in London. Augusto Pinochet was by now 82 years old. Coming on a short trip to London, he found himself arrested. The charge? Crimes against humanity, including dozens of counts of torture. Now let's flash back and go back a few years to 1979. On November 4th, a horde of Iranian students and protesters stormed the American embassy in Tehran, the capital of Iran. As they broke through the embassy compound, American diplomats were shredding documents so fast that their shredder broke. Right? As the events unfolded, 53 American officials were taken hostage in a standoff that lasted 444 days. And Americans sort of watched this crisis unfold every night on the nightly news, right? And as Americans sort of watched this event drag on throughout the last years of the Jimmy Carter presidency, Iranians who were holding the Americans hostage in Iran had a different hobby. They assembled the most complex jigsaw puzzle, perhaps, in human history. They took the shredded documents in the U.S. Embassy and reassembled them. And actually, if you sort of look up the technological history of the shredder, you'll learn that because of this event, they, they learned that they need to cross-cut their shredding. <laughs> A very important moment in the history of technology. Now, what these documents revealed, uh, they revealed something that the Iranians already knew, but most Americans did not know. And they were supported by secret documents in Washington. And that was that in 1953, the Central Intelligence Agency overthrew the popular and democratically elected Prime Minister of Iran. And in his place, they installed, or sort of reinstalled, a royalist dictator who ruled the country with an iron fist for 26 years. 
Let's shift gears again and move again across time and space. And we'll stop. Oh, sorry, skip that one. Uh, Guatemala City, 1955. Uh, then Vice President Richard Nixon uh, was meeting with the head of Guatemalan government, Colonel, Co uh, Colonel Castillo Armas. Uh, and the U.S. government sort of commemorated as part of his friendship tour to Latin America. And so the U.S. Gov government uh, commemorated his trip by making a documentary film that they distributed throughout the region. And the film was called Guatemala Makes a Friend. And I've often sort of thought of this film and wondered to myself that sort of, or sort of reminded myself of that old cliche with friends like these. Anyone care to repeat the second half? <laughs> Who needs enemies, right? Skip back a year. Guatemala, 1954. About a decade before this, Guatemala began moving into a new period of democratic reform. In 1944, there was a popular uprising that swept aside a very unpopular but pro-American dictator. Shortly thereafter, for the first time in Guatemala's history, the country held democratic elections. But this democratic uprising, this I mean, sort of democratic spring, was cut short by a military coup. The coup that plunged Guatemala into a dark and turbulent period of dictatorial rule and civil war uh, was engineered by the Central Intelligence Agency with orders from the American president. In the decades following that coup, there was a tremendous period of uh, repression, civil war, and chaos. Over 200,000 victims died as a result of the repression that, repression that followed. Uh, indeed, in 1983, uh, we, um, we recovered subsequently this document from 1983, perhaps the most sort of grim log uh, in existing in the historical record, right? Detailed recountings of the victims of the Guatemalan secret police, which was in fact trained and equipped by US military forces and by intelligence agents. These kind of events obviously raise troubling questions for Americans seeking to make sense of their history. Right? Americans like to believe that we stand for freedom and democracy and that American foreign policy uh, puts forth these goals of freedom and democracy, right? These are the tenets of Wilsonianism that we talked about earlier in the semester, right? The idea that the United States would be the supporter of self-determination, right? And these ideas are sort of embedded in the American view of the world. When we sort of look at these kinds of events, we, we ask ourselves, what do they mean? What, well, how do we make sense of this? How do they fit into our national story? Are these, um, should we view them as sort of aberrations? Are these just brief moments where uh, the United States caught a flu and did something crazy and then kind of, or so, then sobered up, or I'm um, mixing 17 metaphors. Uh, 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 was it, a, to add another one, was it sort of a typo in the history of the American story? Or was it part of a larger pattern? Well, let's take a look merely at the CIA's connection to this pattern, right? In 1948, the CIA was involved in uh, basically distributing huge tons of cash to favored candidates in the elections in France and Italy. 1951 and 54, organized regime change in Iran and Guatemala. In 57, it tried but failed to organize regime change uh, and engaged in all sort of electoral bribery in Syria and Indonesia. 1958 to 1963, the agency uh, was involved in a plan to destabilize the regime in Iraq, uh, and possibly the details are very, very murky, but possibly involved in an assassination plot uh, that involved actually a very young and at the time mostly insignificant thug by the name of Saddam Hussein. 1961 to uh, 1960 to 1961, there were regime change plots and assassination plots in the Congo and Dominican Republic. For uh, three, four years, the United States tried uh, and failed repeatedly to overthrow the regime of Fidel Castro in Cuba. Uh, money was sent to favored candidates to help uh, favored candidates during elections in Brazil. There were regime change plots in British Guiana and Haiti. From 1954 to 1963, the CIA and other parts of the U.S. government helped to install, prop up, and then remove the president of South Vietnam, events that were absolutely essential to laying the groundwork for what would become the Vietnam War, as we'll talk about later this semester. 1950s into the 1970s, the agency distributed huge subsidies to favored candidates in the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan and helped make that party sort of the, the anchor of the Japanese political system for a generation. Uh, 
uh, as I mentioned, involved in regime change in Chile. Uh, in the 1967 to 74-ish, uh, the agency was involved in supporting military colonels, uh, part of a junta regime that most of the world shunned uh, in Greece. There was attempted regime change in Nicaragua. And then an episode that Americans are surprisingly unaware of, but from 1991 to 2003, uh, there was a failed, consistent, and extremely expensive, we're talking tens of millions of dollars, uh, effort to promote regime change in Iraq. Uh, and I, I put the word covert in quotes here because it actually was the least covert operation in American history because in 1998 the US Congress passed a law called the Iraqi Liberation Act which made it the law of the land that we would overthrow the government of Iraq. All right. So all these things kind of raise questions for us. Now as you see I put the little uh, squiggly mark uh, before all my dates and things as an indicator that the details are very murky. Right? We don't know a lot of stuff. The CIA doesn't really like to ha open up its documents and say, welcome, please look. Right? Uh, but on a few cases, we know a lot. We know a lot. We know a lot about Iran and Guatemala, and we know a lot about Chile. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to look at those three cases and try to give us a sense of what do we know and what can we learn from these experiences. And I think uh, one of the things we need to keep in mind is that as historians, our first and foremost job, or our most difficult job, is not to cast moral judgment. That's easy. It's easy to say something that happened in the past was wrong or foolish uh, or immoral. Um, but it's much more difficult to take the past on its own terms, to ask why something happened, and to try to learn something about ourselves and our national history by asking that question why. So that's what I'd like to try to do today as we look through some of the key moments in the history of regime change and the CIA. But first, let's sort of start at the beginning with the creation of the agency. The agency was created by an act of Congress, the National Security Act, in 1947. Uh, and the legislation basically gave the CIA two tasks. One of them is very easy to find. It was charged with collecting and analyzing intelligence information. And the basic goal was, we had Pearl Harbor, colossal intelligence failure. We should not have that again. Right? The second part of the legislation I quoted for you here. The National Security Act authorized the CIA to, quote, do such other functions and duties related to intelligence affecting national security as the National Security Council may from time to time direct. Right? How would you guys characterize this language? <laughs> Vague, right? So that's, that's kind of an easy one, right? Uh, uh, right? This is the most, perhaps the most general statute uh, in the American legislative record, right? Basically says the CIA can do whatever the National Security Council, which is an arm of the president, uh, directs it to do. And the reason why they didn't say the president is because they had this doctrine of plausible deniability. So the president could say, well, I didn't necessarily do it. Uh, it was the National Security Council that was involved. Now let's turn to our first case, the Iran coup of 1953. And I have here, uh, first of all, a map of Iran, in case you guys forgot where it's located. Uh, but second of all, uh, I have a secret document here um, that, that, that is actually drawn from the CIA archives that was an early planning document for the, for the events that became the coup of 1953. And as you can see, uh, the directive was quite simple. Mossadegh, who was the premier, uh, prime minister of Iran, uh, must go. Right. Now, how do we get to this point? Well, we actually have to go back pretty far to kind of understand the context. We have to go back to 1901, and we have to actually talk about the British Empire. The roots of what would become the, the CIA's coup in Iran can be traced to a sort of single fateful decision made in, made in 1901. At that time, uh, the Iranian government, which was ruled by a uh, sort of uh, a monarchy known as the Qajar dynasty, uh, made a deal with a very wealthy British financier, William Knox Darcy. And basically the deal was this. Uh, Darcy would get the rights, uh, and the, the British would get the rights to explore, and discover, exploit the petroleum resources that they thought existed in Iran at the time. And if anything would happen to be found, the Iranians would get 16% of the profits, and the British would get the rest. A few years later, in 1908, oil, after, actually after drilling a lot of wells that went nowhere, uh, they indeed struck oil. And in 1909, the Anglo-Persian Oil Company was found, and it was later renamed the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, 
Um, and then still much later, actually at the end of my story today, renamed British Petroleum. Now over the years, the British Empire became more and more dependent on Iranian oil. Right? The, right, the British power was rooted in the British Navy, and the British Navy converted to right, oil-powered ships, gasoline-powered ships. Right? And in addition, uh, Iranian petroleum sort of fueled the high living standards of the British population back home. And what the British did is they made sort of a series of deals that gave the UK increasing influence over Iranian affairs. Uh, and one of the most important moments came in 1919 when they signed the Anglo-Persian Agreement. And basically what this agreement did, it was a mutual agreement, uh, but it effectively turned over control over Iran's army, its treasury, its transportation system, and its communication network to the British government. Right? And this was what we call informal empire at work, right? Now in contrast, right, to sort of formal empire where you sort of imagine Darth Vader going in and exerting total control over the side society that uh, is beneath it, right? Informal empire is one in which you kind of let the people do what they want within certain boundaries, right? Uh, and in this case, those boundaries were basically everything that mattered. Military and security affairs and economic affairs, right? Other than that, we don't really care what you do as long as uh, our interests, our economic interests are protected. Now, as you can imagine, this arrangement provoked recurring tension between Iranians and the British. These tensions became especially pronounced after uh, there was a political change in Iran that overthrew the previous dynasty and brought to, brought to power Reza Shah Pahlavi, uh, who pronounced himself Shah, which is sort of the Persian word for king, uh, and he was in power from 1925 to 1941. He was a strong ruler and a reformer, and like others that you've talked about so far, he sought to modernize Iran. He also sought to try to get a better deal from the British, and he would sort of have these recurring negotiations back and forth. Um, he made a little bit of progress, but not a lot. Um, but in any case, by 1941, the British had ha had enough of him, in part because uh, during the war he became cozy with the Germans, which, you know, the Nazis, it's not very good. Uh, and it also had something to do with the fact that he was an increasing thorn in the side of the British leaders. And so they basically said, you have to go, and they put in power his son, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi. Uh, who w was Shah of Iran from 1941 to 1979, with some interruption in between that we'll kind of talk about. Now, Muhammad Reza Shah, the British liked him because he was much more compliant, he was much more pliable. And in fact, the Iranian press sort of derided him and made fun of him, called him a lackey of the British. All right? um, but he was effectively sort of a client ruler, right? And this was part of how informal empire also worked. We put our guy in and we got the stuff that we wanted out. You know, he got to run around at parties and big parades and stuff, lived a pretty decent life, and the British got to protect their interests. Now, a major source of tension in Iran throughout this period were conditions at the Abadan refinery, located here in southern Iran near the border with Iraq. The Abadan refinery was a massive complex. It was the biggest oil refinery in the world. Uh, but the conditions there were... Um, deplorable, especially for the workers. Now, on one hand, you had the sort of uh, British engineers and um, managers who lived in these opulent estates with manicured gardens and swimming pools and all this stuff. And just down the road uh, were the shanty town that the workers lived in. Uh, it was literally a slum. There was no running water or electricity. A lot of the dwellings were made out of oil drums that had been pounded thin and sort of changed into sort of house-like structures. And you can imagine what those pounded oil drums were like in the dead of the summer, right? People baked like ovens. In the winter, right, not a lot of insulation is provided by this kind of dwelling. Uh, and so what they did is they actually had huge warehouses where the workers would move in and live. Uh, you'd have thousands of people, two to 3,000 people living in this one big room, basically, like an aircraft hangar. Uh, and each individual family would get a space of its own about the size of a blanket uh, with no privacy, uh, latrine, etc. cetera. Now, in 1946, the workers at Abadan went on strike. They demanded better housing, decent health care, and better working conditions. And this was sort of the beginning of a major confrontation between the British and the Iranians. The Iranian parliament, called the Majlis, 
began to assert itself, and the sort of Shah's autocratic rule began to kind of uh, come unwind, or began to loosen, uh, as the democratic parliament became more influential. And it began to pressure the British government for better treatment for Iranian workers and a more equitable share of the profits. Uh, one of the demands was they wanted to be able to split the profits 50-50 between the British and the Iranians. Uh, and they also were disturbed by a practice in which technically the British said, we'll give you 16%, I think actually by this point it's 21% of the profits, but they didn't let anyone audit the books. So you had to kind of take their word that this was, uh, they were getting their fair share. For many Iranians, the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, or AIOC, uh, was the symbol, the very symbol of British imperialism. It was also a symbol of their own sort of uh, helplessness um, uh, and, and subject to colonial domination. Uh, and what, within the parliament, one man emerged as the voice of this newly energized Iranian nationalism that was cha uh, challenging British supremacy in the country. And that man was Mohammad Mossadegh. In 1951, he was uh, uh, widely, uh, in a very popular election, elected the prime minister, and in large part because he pledged to stand up to the AIOC, the Iranian, uh, Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. Uh, and in fact, he was so popular that the Shah became nervous and basically handed the premiership, which is like the head of state, over to Mossadegh. Uh, and actually, if you're, shortly thereafter, he flees the country. Uh, he sort of sees himself as basically being put out of power by Mossadegh's popularity. Mossadegh's first act, which was supported by the parliament, was actually to nationalize the Anglo-Iranian oil company, right? Nationalize means it no longer belongs to you, British people, it belongs to us, uh, and he would pay them for it. Uh, and it's actually, this is technically permissible under international law, but you can imagine that neither the British government nor the AIOC were particularly happy about this turn of events. And a huge standoff ensues, right? Now, one of the things the British did is they tried to put the economic squeeze on Mossadegh. And so one of the things they did was they took all their technicians and engineers and withdrew them from the country. Now, do I have any petroleum engineers in the crowd today thinking about it? Uh, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, what would happen to a very large refinery complex if you took out all the engineers? It would sit there, <laughs> absolutely right, right? So what ends up happening is basically uh, the Iranians are unable to do anything about their oil wealth, right? Um, they're unable to, to do the basic things you need to extract and refine the petroleum. Uh, in addition, the British put a de facto blockade on the selling of Iranian oil. Um, they did other measures that effectively brought the Iranian economy to a standstill, and things start unraveling very quickly. But Mossadegh didn't budge. As the crisis dragged on, the British got more and more frustrated by the fact that they're putting the squeeze on, but Mossadegh is not relenting. Uh, and so they start developing plans to overthrow Mossadegh. Their plans were ruined when Mossadegh learned of it and kicked all the British diplomats, diplomats uh, out of the country. So the British turned to the United States and began lobbying the newly created CIA to join with them in an operation to overthrow uh, Prime, uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh. Now the British knew, right, this is the height of the Cold War, and the British knew there was a simple argument that they needed to make in order to get the Americans play ball. Describe Mossadegh as a communist stooge, right? And so they begin passing on intelligence information, suggesting alarming information, suggesting that Mossadegh was a tool of the Kremlin, an agent of the communist influence. Now what they didn't say, and this is very curious, they didn't actually say that Mossadegh was a communist. Right? Because everyone knew that he wasn't. But they said he was going to pave the way for communist domination of his country. Of, and they, they pointed to things like he had a couple of uh, communists uh, in his government, uh, and he allowed the, commu the Iranian Communist Party, which was called the Tudeh Party, to operate freely in the country. And they said these are, and he, also, he was also reasonably nice to the Russians. And all these things added up to evidence that he was going to pave the way for communist influence, uh, which very strategically located country with large petroleum reserves, uh, right next to a lot of other countries with large petroleum reserves. Huge alarm bells go off in Washington. Uh, the United States government goes into a state of virtual panic. They, these arguments were sort of got a receptive ear in the new American president that was elected in 1953, President Dwight Eisenhower. And that year, he ordered approval of Operation Ajax, 
Uh, Operation Ajax was led by a guy known uh, with, by the name of Kermit Roosevelt, a CIA operative known as Kermit Roosevelt. He was the grandson of Theodore Roosevelt, but absolutely no relation to the frog. <laughs> yes, I've made that joke roughly 792 times. Okay. Now, the plan that, that Kermit Roosevelt developed in... Uh, yes, sir? Um, Do you think there's any strong evidence that there, I mean, was kind of some involvement between Iran and the Soviets at the time, or was that all just kind of British made-up stuff? It was... It was um, the preponderance of the evidence suggests uh, it was wildly exaggerated. So Mossadegh's biggest sin was not in clamping down on the Tudeh party, the Communist Party of Iran. Uh, but historians have unearthed no sort of meaningful evidence linking or sort of linking him directly with the Soviet leadership or sort of suggesting that he was an agent or somehow a crony of the Kremlin. Yeah. Now, the plan for Operation Ajax uh, was basically the plan that would be followed in many other similar operations. They would uh, wage an extensive propaganda campaign against Mossadegh to undermine his leadership, undermine his credibility. They would uh, organize a campaign of economic sabotage, right? When things go bad economically, people get upset and they start blaming people, right? We've seen this. Uh, and they did things like uh, pay cash money, and they had a lot of it to spread around, cash money to basically goons and thugs to stir up trouble. Uh, and including uh, among the sort of more humorous ones were circus performers uh, and weightlifters who were given chunks of cash to sort of go out and create havoc in the streets of Tehran. Uh, creates a, actually kind of a very funny image, but... <laughs> now this was a formula that they applied elsewhere, right? Trigger economic arrest, you know, unrest, trigger a crisis, and make things so bad that the military would step in to impose order, right? Now, a key element of the plot was that the CIA, and in fact, Kermit Roosevelt here in particular, had to convince Mohammad Reza Shah, who had fled the country, um, they had to convince him to sign a document dismissing Mossadegh, and then they had to convince him to come back in. And this was actually kind of a hard sell because the Shah was kind of um, not the strongest and most brave of characters. <laughs> um, so, ultimately, the agency got the army on board, they, or the army arrested Mossadegh, and the Shah returned to Iran in triumph. And here you, well, here you can see him stepping off the airplane. Shortly after he landed, he turns to Kermit Roosevelt and says to him, I owe my throne to God, my people, my army, and to you. Now, what's the legacy of all this? Well, there's a part of the important economic legacy. All right? And one thing is that the, the Shah uh, makes a new deal with the international oil companies. And basically, the, the Iranians say, we're going to split the oil profits that come out of our country on a 50-50 basis. 50% 50 will go to us, the government of Iran, and 50% will go to an international consortium, which will in turn distribute them among themselves. And according to this deal, British Petroleum, which was the AIOC, and actually you can see him here changing the signs, uh, British Petroleum would get 40%. U.S. companies would get 40 percent, uh, and other European companies would get 20 percent. Now, if you sort of look at this, right, the British now, the sort of irony here is the British got a much worse deal. If they had simply said to Mossadegh way back when, we'll split it with you, we'll deal with that consequence, right? Now they're getting, instead of 50-50, they're getting 40 percent of 50 percent, right? And the more important legacy is now the American petroleum industry and American security is now linked as well to Iranian petroleum. There was another legacy as well, and that is one American president after another courted, courted the Shah of Iran. They provided him with arms and economic aid, and they trained his secret police. Every now and then, uh, the secret police was called Savak. It was very brutal. They had all kinds of torture chambers and the usual things that secret police do. And every now and then, the American president would say, uh, please don't be so horrible, and the Shah would say, um, why don't you give me more money? And the Americans would say, well, you should be less horrible. And he says, well, if you don't give me more money, I'm going to turn to the Russians. And then they'd give him more money. All right? And this was sort of a recurring pattern that played out. Now, under the Shah, Iran became a pillar of U.S. influence in the Middle East until everything exploded in 1979. And indeed, one of the main reasons that Iranians stormed the embassy in 1979 was because they were afraid the Americans would do it again. Let's turn to another case, Guatemala. Uh, 
1954. Located in Central America, uh, just south of Mexico, uh, and not, a, not, not a terribly far from the country of Cuba. Now at the center of the story in Guatemala uh, was a figure by the name of Jacobo Arbenz Guzman, popularly known as Arbenz. Now Arbenz had been a colonel in the army in Guatemala, and he participated in the Guatemalan Revolution in 1944 that had swept aside a hated dictator and put in place to sort of sowed the seeds for the potential of a long-running uh, Guatemalan democracy. Arbenz himself was democratically elected in 1951, and this was the first peaceful transfer of power in Guatemala's history. Now, as president, Arbenz laid out three objectives for his country. First, economic independence. Second, economic development. And third, raise living standards for the people, fight poverty in his country. Now, to him, all of these were about removing the vestiges of colonialism that were a product of foreign domination of Guatemala's economy. But they clashed very significantly with powerful foreign-owned economic interests. You had uh, Electric Bond and Share, which basically was a foreign company that controlled the entire electrical system in Guatemala. You had International Railways of Central America, which controlled the entire rail system, which is an effectively complete control of the transportation system. And then most importantly, you have United Fruit Company, uh, which was uh, very influential in bringing people the banana, uh, but was actually an incredibly powerful force in Guatemala. Uh, United Fruit owned about a fifth of the country's land, arable land, uh, and it was the largest landowner and the largest employer in Guatemala. It also happened to own 46% of the stock of international railways, which gave it a huge influence over the country's transportation system. Arbenz challenged all of these interests. He proposed building a public electric system to challenge the electric monopoly. He imposed investments in transportation that would challenge the transportation monopoly. And he, most controversially, he put forward a plan of land re redistribution. He basically said, he passed, actually passed a law um, that was unanimously passed by the Guatemalan parliament that said, uh, we're going to take uh, any huge tract of land that is not cultivated, not currently being used, and we're going to cut it up and we're going to give it to poor peasants so that they could have their own farm plots and economic independence. This posed a huge problem for United Fruit. Not only did it own a fifth of the land, but it actually only cultivated 15% of it. Right? So that means under this law, basically the Guatemalan government is going to expropriate, take away 85% of the land held by United Fruit. Now they didn't do this without offering compensation and Arbenz was very smart. He offered to pay them $1.185 million for the land which was the sum that United Fruit had declared for tax purposes. For those of you who ever prepared your tax, taxes, you may know that sometimes the value we put on things for uh, tax purposes is not exactly the value of things as they are. United Fruit saw all these things as a huge assault on its position in Guatemala uh, and on its potential for profits, and it reacted with a vengeance. Uh, and first thing it tried to do is stir up opposition to, you, to, to our bends within the United States. So they hired the best and most influential public relations agent in the history of the United States, a guy by the name of Edward Bernays. He had sort of basically invented um, or certainly perfected the practice of propaganda and public relations. Um, and he stirred up um, all kinds of press stories and things, dramatizing, presenting our bends as a tool of the communists. The company also had two very powerful friends in the United States government. One of them was John Foster Dulles, the American Secretary of State, who uh, had served as a very influential international lawyer and had represented United Fruit for many years. And the other was his brother, Alan Dulles, who just happened to be director of the CIA and had also represented United Fruit as a lawyer and owned a lot of United Fruit stock. The two men uh, effectively uh, convinced President Eisenhower to again op uh, or, uh, approve a covert operation, this time Operation PB Success, and the goal was to overthrow Arbenz. The plan was very similar to the one in Iran. Uh, 
The CIA put the economic squeeze on Guatemala to sow domestic unrest. There was an extensive propaganda campaign, including uh, black, propag uh, black radio stations and um, a plan that used uh, Catholic priests in Guatemala to give sermons and distribute pamphlets talking about how our Benz was a danger to the faith uh, and an evil to God. Uh, it also courted friends in the Guatemalan army, and their most important contact was Colonel Ca Carlos Castillo Armas. Now at the time, he was a former Guatemalan army officer who was living in Honduras. The CIA found him, offered to put him in power, and provided him with arms, money, and a private army. Together with uh, the CIA, they, uh, the, the, they launched the, these bombing raids on Guatemala City um, using American aircraft, the purpose of which was to stimulate terror and panic, and it worked. When the smoke had cleared, Arbenz agreed to resign at gunpoint, and he was replaced by the CIA's chosen man, Carlos Castillo Armas. Now, one of his first acts was to round up supporters of our Benz and get rid of them. And here's actually a CIA cable that has since been declassified, uh, explaining that they're, they're providing lists of persons to be disposed of. Right? And those lists fell into two categories. Category, category one was persons to be disposed of through executive action, right? the CIA's euphemism for assassination. Now, we don't exactly know uh, again, because of the limits of the documentation, what role exactly the CIA played in um, the assassinations and, and targeted killings that followed, but we know certainly that they planned it and that this information was communicated to our bands, uh, our, our mas. By now, you should see a pattern, and it repeated itself in Chile in 1970, in the 1970s, right? And again, we have a pretty decent array of declassified documents that tell us what took place. Right? And here you can see a cable from uh, Washington to the CIA station arguing that it is firm and continuing policy, policy that Allende be overthrown by a coup. Again, the key, key figure at, at play here was uh, a leftist reformer, Salvador Allende. Again, he challenged powerful foreign economic interests, which he saw as a form of economic domination, economic colonialism of his country. Now, but in contrast to the situations in, in Iran and Guatemala, the situation is a little bit more complicated because this case, the CIA pledged to um, determine to overthrow Allende before he had even taken power. And that requires to sort of understand that curious turn of logic. We have to explain a little bit of what that means. So the Chilean political system often has multi-party candidates. Uh, it would have a long constitutional tradition, and typically if a candidate did not win a majority of, of votes, the Chilean Congress would have to certify the election, basically ratify the results. Uh, as it turned out, Allende in 1970 won 36%, and so the Chilean Congress had a fixed period of time uh, in which to certify the results and pronounce him as president. The CIA decided early on that it wanted to stop that from happening. Why did it do so? Well, a key figure decided that it was in U.S. interests to make sure that Allende did not take power. Interestingly enough, that key figure also won an American political election with three candidates and did not win a majority of votes. That person was Richard Nixon. And again, powerful economic interests and personal connections to the White House played a role. And there was a key operator here, a guy by the name of Donald Kendall, uh, pictured here on the left, uh, and what he's doing is actually pouring the leader, uh, a, a Pepsi Cola for the leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, when Richard Nixon was vice president and spending a little time in Moscow. Right. Now, what happened here? Well, Kendall was the CEO of Pepsi, uh, and he was the principal distributor of Pepsi Cola in Chile. He had ties to some of the most richest and most powerful people in the country. And one of his friends and contacts was Chile's richest man, a guy by the name of Augustine Edwards, who controlled the largest and most influential newspaper in the country. He was kind of like the Rupert Murdoch of Chile. Uh, Edwards had a panic attack when Allende was elected. He traveled to Washington, met with Kendall, said, Kendall, you have got to meet with Nixon. Nick, uh, Kendall picks up the phone and schedules an appointment with the President of the United States. Right? This is a sign you have some connections. 
right? I've tried, you know, to schedule appointments before. It hasn't really panned out very well. <laughs> so Kendall meets President, uh, personally with President Nixon uh, to discuss the situation and says, Allende is a communist stooge who's going to wreak havoc on all our interests in Chile. After the meeting ends, Nixon holds another meeting later that day with Henry Kissinger, his national security advisor, uh, and with Richard Helms, the CIA director. And we actually have, we don't have uh, the complete record of what was discussed there. It was only a 13-minute meeting. But we have the handwritten notes composed by Rick, Richard Helms, the CIA director of that meeting. And it's all chicken scratch, so I uh, transcribed it over here on your left. Right? And this is what, he's taking notes as he's meeting with Nixon for those 13 minutes. He says, one in 10 chance perhaps, but save Chile. Worth spending. Not concerned. No involvement of the embassy. 10 million available, more if necessary. Full-time job, best men we have. Game plan, make the economy scream. 48 hours for plan of action. Right? In other words, this is the marching orders, right? And it has tremendous urgency, right? right? Get going, get this thing moving. Now, why would the American government care so much about an election of Chile. In fact, Henry Kissinger had once sort of derided Chile as a heart of Antarctica. Right? It was a sign that maybe he didn't consider it the most vital interest of the United States. Okay, in case you guys don't know, Antarctica, big frozen continent, you know, a lot of penguins. Okay. Again, we see that economic interests are pivotal. Right? Chile was the leading producer of copper. And two American companies, Kennecott Copper and Anaconda Copper, uh, dominated the mining industry in Chile. Most of Chile's uh, export revenues came from the copper mining, uh, and fully one-third of the government's tax revenues came from these two companies alone. In addition, you also had International Telephone and Telegraph, or ITT, which controlled the country's communication system. ITT viewed Allende as a grave threat. They was afraid he was going to take over the telecommunications industry. Uh, and they were so upset that they actually communicated to Richard Nixon and the US government uh, that they would give the US government a million dollars to overthrow Allende. Right? This is a sign that corporate uh, interests were very, very concerned. So initially, the CIA approves this plan and initially pursues the first track, which is simply to prevent the Chilean Congress from ratifying Allende's election. That plan was unsuccessful. The Congress proceeded as planned, and the CIA turned to track two, foment a military coup. Now, what's interesting about the case in Chile was actually how difficult it was to foment a coup to foment a military coup. Chile had a long tradition of constitutional governance and, the, and a sort of tradition of separating military from political affairs, much the way that the Americans also celebrate such a tradition. And they had trouble convincing military officers to stage a coup d'etat, to reverse that tradition. So the agency calculated it needed to create a serious economic crisis in order to convince the military to intervene. And the basic plan was if Chile fell into, fell into serious economic decline, there would be chaos, and that would prompt a military coup to restore order. So they did things like cancel all U.S. aid to Chile. They had uh, Chile's credit rating slashed so they could get no loans. Um, it funneled $3.5 million to opposition parties and to allied organizations. It spent $2 million on a propaganda campaign, sent $1.5 million to business groups, labor groups, and paramilitary organizations to organize protests and riots and strikes. Uh, they organized a huge transportation strike where the, the truckers, uh, trucking industry came to a standstill. People couldn't get food. Um, created this huge economic crisis. And it was supported by the American business community, which created an ad hoc working group to coordinate measures to bring the Chilean economy to a standstill. While all this was going on, Allende convinced the Chilean Congress to nationalize, that is, take over the copper industry, as well as to take over control over ITT. Now, the CIA continued to have a difficult time overthrowing Allende, in large part because the head of the Chilean army, a guy by the name of General Rene Schneider, refused to intervene. He sort of had uh, too much respect for the Chilean uh, constitutional system, 
So the CIA arranged to have him kidnapped, and in the process, he was Allende managed to hold on to power until that fateful day of September 11th, 1973. So what do we learn from all these episodes? Oh, I haven't been skipping ahead. Well, one thing that was when some of, the, some of this information was made public in the mid-1970s, one of the charges that emerged with that was that the CIA was a rogue agency. It was a rogue elephant. It was like a big colossus just running around sowing chaos and madness without any oversight or authorization. Um, but that actually misses the point. All of these operations were ordered by a democratically elected American president, and all of them were effectively in line with U.S. law. Right? The agency, as we know, did a lot of things that actually were illegal during the Cold War, um, but fomenting unrest, subsidizing newspapers and propaganda, distributing cash and weapons to rebels, uh, orchestrating the overthrow of foreign governments, all of these were permissible under U.S. law. So it, it becomes sort of difficult to make the case that the CIA was a rogue agency. The more interesting thing we need to think about is what are the implications about Congress delegating an extraordinary amount of power to a secret agency that's unaccountable to the American electorate. Second question emerged, were these success stories? Right? And I often have my students uh, in other classes that I've taught that have been all about the CIA, I've had them write essays about what, were these operations successful? And the answers that students usually write uh, is that um, yes and no. On the one hand, they were a short-term success. In Iran, the United States got a dependable client state for 26 years. Right? It got what it wanted. It got a toehold in the Iranian petroleum. It had a close ally. It had a strategic position. Right? Uh, but on the other hand, over the long term, these operations not only sort of perpetuated uh, disappearances and murder, these are the pictured here are the victims of, of some of the victims of Pinochet's regime, uh, but also anti Americanism, radicalism, and a sense of distrust of American power. Right? It's not uncommon for foreigners to see the hand of the CIA in everything that goes sort of amiss, right? even when the CIA is not, in fact, involved, right? There's actually sort of bizarre tendency to exaggerate the power of the CIA. I've sort of given you the three most dramatic cases, but if I scroll back in my slides to that image I showed you at the beginning, you'll remember that I talked about there are a lot of cases of failed attempts, botched attempts, or things that didn't quite work out the way we had planned. In addition, there's also an important trend that connects to a larger conflict that's going on in world history, in the modern world at this time. And it's a larger battle over economic resources in the 20th century. And as I've tried to emphasize, you can't understand uh, the, these operations without understanding the economic conditions that were at play. Note that in all of the cases, the key factor that triggers the crisis is the nationalization or the threat of nationalization of powerful industries. Right? For Mossadegh, it was the Anglo-Iranian oil company. For Arbenz, it was United Fruit. For Allende, it was the mining companies and ITT. And what you had is you had effectively two titanic and opposing forces at play here. On the one hand, you had big foreign companies that had invested huge amounts of money uh, in the development of these industries and expected and felt beholden to their stockholders to secure the profits that come from those investments. And on the other hand, the very power and influence of those com companies helped foster nationalist movements. Right? Nationalist leaders in the third world, like Mossadegh, Arbenz, and Allende, argued that their resources should benefit their people. And they also argued that foreign control over those resources undermined their sovereignty and perpetuated poverty. Right? And so here we can see Salvador Allende speaking to the United Nations shortly before he's deposed. He summarizes the sort of general sentiment within third world nationalism. Our economy could no longer tolerate the subordination implied by having more than 80% of its exports in the hands of a small group of large foreign companies. Right? And so for him, the question was really about sovereignty as well as about poverty. Now, the great sort of tragedy of all this was that in both sides of this struggle, industry and the nationalists could not find common ground, a solution that would keep them both from going to the brink. Now, the third thing we can sort of gather from all this 
is sort of, ex uh, sort of an understanding of why Americans operated in the way that they did during the Cold War. And one of the most sort of powerful things to emerge from Cold War history is that Americans tended to confuse nationalism with communism. There was sort of an assumption that anywhere there was trouble around the world, right here you can see uh, Joseph Stalin with his tentacles going into, going into the trouble, all the trouble spots of the world. There was an assumption that wherever there was trouble, the evil hand of the Kremlin must be at work. And so nationalism, they saw such things as land redistribution and the nationalization of industries as being the first steps toward a communist takeover. These must have been masterminded by Moscow. Now, historians have poured over these episodes, and they've sort of dissected them, you know, to the point of ridiculousness, and they found no meaningful evidence linking Mossadegh, Arbenz, or Allende to the Soviet Union. None of these guys was tools of the Kremlin, but Americans had difficulty seeing the nuance of what was at play. But actually, what's even more remarkable is if you look at the classified documents in U.S. archives, you'll see that Americans actually kind of sort of knew that their assumptions were wrong. Um, many intelligence analysts would say things like, Mossadegh may not have been a communist, but he was going to lead to a communist takeover. Arbenz probably wasn't a communist, but he was going to pave the way for a communist takeover. Allende, probably not a communist, but going to lead to a communist takeover, right? And this kind of raises a question. Did Americans not understand third world nationalism, or did they not want to understand third world nationalism? Richard Helms at one point hinted that perhaps he knew the answer, reflecting back on the event in Chile that he helped orchestrate. He said, we did not choose to know, so we did not know how much we did not know. Now the last thing that sort of explains these operations was what could be called a total war mindset that took place during the Cold War. And here I've juxtaposed a propaganda poster from World War II with a propaganda poster from the Cold War period. These kinds of operations stemmed from a mindset that viewed the Cold War as effectively as the same thing as total war that had preceded it. World War II and the Cold War just kind of blended together. Uh, one guy said uh, after World War II, the, the fighting continued, just the names had changed. Uh, and that kind of symbolized in many ways how the Americans looked at the world. And they believed that the enemy was ruthless and would employ any tactics to win, and therefore that the United States should be just as ruthless as their opponent. Uh, CIA Director Richard Helms talked about this, the ways in which World War II and the Cold War became meshed together. He said, in World War II, we knew what our motivation was, to beat the goddamn Nazis. In the Cold War, we knew what our motivation was, to beat the goddamn Russians. Right? You get this sort of, in the simplicity of it, you can see how those two become intertwined, right? And you also get a sense of how the, the sort of moral calculus rested upon a decision that we have to fight fire with fire. So, for example, here's a quote from a top secret report compiled by uh, James Doolittle on intelligence activities for President Eisenhower in 1954. Uh, and you'll find this quote cited in basically every book, every book ever written by the CIA, about the CIA. And the report points out, it is now clear that we are facing a f an implacable enemy whose avowed objective is world domination by whatever means and at whatever cost. There are no rules in such a game. Right? Hitherto acceptable norms of human conduct do not apply. If the United States is to survive, we must learn to subvert, sabotage, and destroy our enemies by more clever, more sophisticated, and more effective methods than those used against us, right? And otherwise, the basic logic is to defeat the enemy, we have to become them. We, to fight fire, we have to use fire, right? Some people have pointed out that sometimes it's better to fight fire with water. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I know you guys have to go to class, but anyone have any burning questions? Uh, yes, right here. Um, on that kind of complete list uh, you showed us of times where the CIA was involved in, uh, or at least attempted a takeover, in how many of those cases were there actual Soviet involvement, and how many were there kind of suspected Soviet involvement, and how many, like, neither? Yeah, so I, I haven't done the sort of strict 
calculus sort of adding up the numbers. Uh, but we find in most cases is that there is this sort of larger blurring of assumptions, right? There were often what we call local communist movements, which sort of took sort of inspiration from um, Marxist resistance to imperialism as they saw it. Uh, but an American sort of assumed if there's a communist in Indonesia, he must be controlled by Moscow. And that was the assumption that was wrong in almost every single case. Um, that the reality was is that these were people who were motivated by senses of economic injustice, sometimes concerned for their own power, um, uh, but they were not fundamentally controlled by Moscow. Um, and so sometimes the Russians would capitalize on this, right? They would send money or sort of extend moral support. Uh, but there have been really no meaningful cases uh, except within the immediate um, borders of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe where you see evidence of the Soviets directly inspiring these uh, and, and fomenting these rebellions. Any other questions? All right, well, I know you've got to go, so thanks a lot. Have a good day. Oh, I forgot to take a drink. I forgot to point out my...